Sounds like they're coming this way, so hold thumbs. Now, um, what is the plan for today? In actual fact, probably not to go too far. As I'm standing here right now, I'm getting a bit wet. <laughs> so it looks like something, some squall is coming out of the south and the west over there, which is fairly common. It's not an uncommon thing to have rain come out of that way. They did predict a lot of rain over the next sort of 48 hours or so. Somewhere in the next 48 hours, they've predicted a lot of rain, which is a good thing. Rain is always a good thing. We're looking forward to it. Um, but I'm back on quarantine again, mostly because I want to find you that garbage bag that baboon spiders spin. For the life of me, I have not managed to find another one since the first one I so easily found when I figured out that these tarantulas or that these, these baboon spiders do spin these refuse bags at the beginning of, this, of the summer. They do a little bit of a spring clean and I'm really, really wanting to show you one. Quarantine, of course, is this massive clearing that you can see in front of me. It stretches in extent, I suppose about a mile by a mile wide. Maybe not as far as that, probably just less than a mile. A mile across by a mile long and is the part of our exercise track right here. We, we do laps around these, this area to keep ourselves looking sleek and slim and fit and trim for all of you. Ah. It's actually a pleasant day, day to be out here. It's like a light spattering of rain. You probably can see a little bit on the lens that you've got there now. Now, I'm being told as I'm busy looking for these baboon spiders in this area that Glory has asked a question that Jamie has put forward to us to answer. Um, does the increase in water mean that tadpoles uh, go from tadpole to frog a bit quicker, if I get the meaning of the question over there? Um, let's see how I'm going to answer that question. No, I don't think so. I think that um, it's, a, it's a set stage, it's a set... Uh, uh, um, period, the frogs need that amount of time to generate enough metabolic energy to go through the transformation that they need. I don't think that that uh, is variable. It, it might be slightly variable and they are cold blooded and that means that environmental temperature dictate and, avail and food availability dictate growth rate and so a warmer climate with more food equals a faster growth rate and that could accelerate it. So. Maybe I'll change my answer there um, and take it away from, of course the water availability is important. Without water the frogs will not be able to develop from tadpoles to frogs. Um, so given that there's water of infinitely variable depth but that there is water there, uh, a very warm temperature, so an average, average warm temperature and lots of food will mean a faster growth rate. But it's not necessarily dependent on the water. I hope that answered your question. Seems to have answered it for me. Dave, are you happy with that answer? <laughs> and we've already got our millipede. These guys make such fantastic value out here on these bushwalks. Ah, you may have noticed a wiping of the lens there. And that was simply because the rain makes it difficult for David to maintain a clear focus and to give you a nice picture. And so he was just quickly wiping the lens. We can expect a couple more of those. Now what I do want to show you here is have a look at these little passengers, these mites. Now one would think that a mite being present on the body of a millipede like this would be a parasite of some sort, but I've just recently read that these mites are actually passengers from one point to another and that they feed on fungus that at the time, they do a favor to the millipede for, they say thank you very much for the lift and they clean the body of the millipede of fungus, which is a big problem for insects out here. And then they go from one fungus bed to another because millipedes eat fungus. So they're not parasitic, para, parasites on the, uh, on the actual uh, millipede. They are just passengers. Now, of course, there are mites that will feed on millipedes. I am not a mite expert at all, so it's tough for me to say exactly what this is. They look full and they look like they're feeding on the body. 
the only the only place to get into the millipede's body is where the legs come out and as you can see there is a mite quite close to the legs over there and this mite here looks quite full so tough to say in this particular case but something that has grabbed my attention I've been wanting to show you for an age I've managed to find while talking to you Dave you might have to come around this side I have found the nest of a trapdoor spider yes finally I have found the very very well camouflaged nest of a trapdoor spider here it is right here it is covered by its silken lid and have a look why these things are impossible to find when I close it it disappears there is the trap door let's tease it open have a look inside there can everyone see? Yep. So there's a there's a silken tunnel there. Inside will live a trapdoor spider. They will hunt the area directly around their web, setting snare lines. And then when they need to cover up, they just pull close the lid and it disappears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How amazingly camouflaged is that? I literally have been looking for the last couple of weeks to show you one of these, and I'm so happy I have. Now you get two different types of trapdoor spiders. You get the cork lid trapdoor spider, and you get the wafer lid trapdoor spider. This seems to be the wafer lid. You can see it's got quite a skinny lid, and it looks like the spider is absent. Isn't that cool? So that's bushwalk to all of you out there. The wafer lid trapdoor spider. And just have a look at that camouflage. Invisible, open. How you'd find them when they are invisible, I wouldn't even begin to be able to tell you. <laughs> How incredible is that? <laughs> ah, yes. Looks like it's getting darker on the horizon there, David. All right, I, um, I think while we go and search for something else wonderful to show you, why don't we go and see how that lion tracking with Jamie is going. Uh, while Steph searches for things with more than four legs, I'm still on the hunt for my four-legged lion who has come through into this general direction. Now on a cold day like today, there is a chance he is still moving. So I'm trying to work as quickly as possible. I'm trying to track as quickly as possible because I have uh, serious doubts in my own mind that he is lying down somewhere. I mean, he might be. He's a male lion, it is what they do best, all lions, but he's, his stride suggested that he was moving with a great deal of determination. And you can tell that just by looking at the spacing between the tracks, between the back and the front track, and his, his back track was falling far away from his front track, so he was, he was not messing around whenever he walked along that road. He's on a serious mission. I'm trying to work out exactly where he's planning on going. The Nkuhumas are all the way to the west. The sticks are further to the south, so he's obviously on patrol. And the question is how far is he going to go in the next few hours? Hopefully not off Juma completely. Let's just do a quick circle. I must have, when we were sitting with the Hardy Dars, I think that's when he was calling south of our boundary and he must have then walked along very rapidly. So we're not too far, we shouldn't be too far behind him. Hello boy, have you seen a big lion? No, all right then. I'll try not to take it personally, bye-bye. <laughs> An Impala Ram very rapidly on the move.
Right, well, we search for Africa's largest predator. Let's go and see what minuscule thing Steph has to show you. I'm absolutely sure Jamie will pull out those lines if they're on the property. She is an incredibly gifted woman. But have a look at this male bushfowl rain frog. I know it's a male because he's small. Females are about three or four times the size. But just have a look at this little guy. Also, wonderfully camouflaged, just here on this bare patch of sand. He's in search of a female. That is what he's doing, wandering around this time of the day. He's looking for a female. He will then elicit a bit of a courtship with her and if she likes him she will allow him to climb up onto her back where she exudes a glue basically carries him around like a little bit of a uh, and basically they stay glued for as long as she needs him uh, to fertilize all her eggs and then she dissolves the glue and he carries on with his day so he doesn't really have much say after that so once he's done his job he then gets glued to her and she walks around carrying him around as a handbag uh, or a backpack I should say. But just have a look at how cute this guy's faces are. These bushfowl rain frogs, their faces and their facial expressions are for me where it's all at to them. Now you notice I'm not touching him. The reason for that is that frog's skin is quite porous and we got a lot of oils and acids on our hands even though you know, from soaps and detergents and whatnot, and I don't want to touch him and get any of that stuff through his skin. Such a tiny little fellow. Now, almost anything will gobble him up, hence that quite cryptic camouflage. They are mainly nocturnal. He's just running around here, having been caught, I think, by sunrise and by the cloudy weather. But you can imagine that he, if he were to sense movement in the darkness and keep still, that he'd be virtually invisible at night time. In actual fact, I think totally invisible for most things, unless something's hunting by sound, of course. So the process by which he mates with a female is called amplexus. Now, Adrian, you've asked if it's true if some frogs can change gender. Hmm, let me think. I don't know of any frog, Adrian, in my knowledge base that can change gender. Um, in other words, you're saying that they're hermaphrodites. Uh, that's fairly common in the insect world. Um, but as far as I know, females and male frogs are female and male frogs. I'm going to say that, Adrian. Um, I don't know if there is. You're welcome to send me through an example if you know of one locally where you're from, Adrian. Um, of course, you can use those questions at wildearth.tv or the hashtag Safari Live. Let me know. Um, I by no means am a frog expert and so would, wouldn't be the, the, the end-all authority, at least, on, in, on frogs in any case. So are there hermaphroditic frogs is the question from Adrian this morning to all of us. And I am unsure. And so that is that little bushfowl drain frog. So the process that is mating between frogs is called amplexus. And where the male is stuck to the female, it's called cohesion amplexus. That is the way that these frogs mate with one another. The frogs have got some of the most amazing sort of things like this. So you get this little guy who ends up being a backpack on his female. You get the foam nest frogs who communally sort of fertilize the female's eggs. The males all sort of uh, sort of band together and help fertilize all the female's eggs and at the same time kick up this foam which turns a, a hard pastarine-esque covering. You get all the poison dart frogs up in the tropics that carry a tadpole on their back in a, in a slimy mucus covering and put them into the bromeliad pools. Bromeliad is a type of flowering plant that grows up in the top of a canopy of trees. And what else do we have? I mean yesterday on, on walk, yesterday afternoon, uh, I found one of the first African bullfrogs of the season. And that little, Af that big African bullfrog, it's a frog probably about this big, it 
covers itself in this mucus covering and spends the winter in this mucus cage basically. I mean they're just actually quite amazing creatures. Um, and if you didn't already know this of course frog numbers worldwide are in decline as a sign they're one of the, the one of the most sensitive not the one of the most they are a sensitive group of animals on the planet and changes to the planet's chemistry and to just the way things are at the moment has a drastic effect on frogs. Now Michael you asked why, do the, why are the males so much smaller than the females in this particular case of this little bushveld drain frog? Simply because of that adhesion and plexus. If he was a big bulky male that needed to dominate the female she wouldn't be able to carry him around easy. So she, he's at, at the exact the right size to fight off other males when he is a, a in or vying for competition courting with this female he's at exactly the right size to fight off a male but at the same time be small enough so that when he's being carried around by the female that it's not at too high a cost for her she obviously as well can't get exponentially just bigger and bigger and bigger uh, simply because she'd need more food that way and being bigger doesn't necessarily always mean better. So they're at the exactly the right sort of size to weight ratio that he needs to be. This time of the year the females are in burrows. They call from the entrance of burrows and these males respond to that. And that is exactly what he's busy doing at the moment. Probably also looking for a place to hide out for the rest of the, the morning somewhere cool and where he can stay out of sight. Ah, it is very nice. Let's see which direction we're going. I think I'm just going to put my face into the wind this morning in actual fact. All right, so some of you are going to be going off for a break and um, why don't you stay tuned because when you get back, Jamie will have more news on her lion tracking. Maybe even have the lion. <laughs> and for everyone else, we'll carry on moving down here into this drainage line, which sort of forms the western edge of quarantine. Now, for the last couple of days I haven't really been much further away than the crests surrounding this open area and I actually just want to trawl through the edge of this drainage line in front of us over here this morning. I'm going to sort of go to the forest verge and go and see what we can see there. Of course being a little bit closer to the drainage line means that there's a little bit more subterranean water there and uh, I'm hoping that that has a different dynamic on the animals that we're seeing, on the insects and the animals that we're seeing. So it's going to take us a little bit of time just to get down there and in the meantime why don't we go find out what Mr. Henry has been doing for the last couple of minutes. We've just come across some male lion tracks, but we're just trying to figure out where they've gone. They don't, I don't think, seem to be the freshest tracks in the universe, unfortunately. But maybe we'll be lucky. Oh, my aging bones. Um, we too found a bushfield rain frog, interestingly, it was a little male bushfield rain frog. We had to remove him off the road, I'm afraid. He was about to be squished by a car. Now, you, I don't know if you saw male or female, but the one we saw was that big. Tiny little thing, and they sit on the back of the females that I think you were looking at a female, I'm not sure. Right, so the, male tr the lion tracks come here. If I can find one to show you, that is precisely what I shall do. But they're very faint. Here's the last one that I can see here. We're just going to see if they go off the road or not. No, he's still there. Here he goes. It's so very difficult on a road like this because it's so hard and so much traffic goes up and down, but he seems to be angling 
off the road in that direction there. There's a road not far from here. Let's go and see if he crosses over there. Not convinced of how fresh these things are. And of course, the male lions, as Jamie, I think, has just said to you, often on a mission. The Inkahumas, I've just heard, found a lass and a liek inside um, elephant plains. Right. <clears throat> we'll go and drive up this road here. Let's see what we can find. I think Andrew is also around here. Linda, you're wondering about the uh, how we can tell the male from female from the tracks. Same way, Linda, that if you saw tracks along a beach, for example, of human beings, you'd be pretty able to, or pretty much able to tell whether they were male, female, or child, just from the size. It's just the size. Uh, the shape is slightly different in the same way that a man's foot is wider than a woman's foot normally, unless she's a particularly buxom lady. Uh, you'll find that the shape is just slightly different and they are generally bigger. Now we have 40 seconds to return to our pretend, from our pretend advert break. And these are very important things and we do thank you for bearing with us while we do these practices because they are not easy for us to get the timings just right on. Right, we're going back to TV in 20 seconds, everybody. 20 seconds. Are you ready? Things are going to explode. Fireworks are going to go off. Welcome back everybody on your live safari here from the middle of the African wild. Jamie Patterson is knocking about over there trying to find sign of lions. We've just found lion tracks coming this way and Stefan Winterboer also on the trail on foot of lions. That of course is the best way to be tracking. Right there everybody, there we are. We've done our kind of advert practice thing there now. Now we'll just keep an eye out here, Let's see if we can't, I'm just listening to the radio. I think that there are people following male lion tracks far further to the east of where we are now. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So they, I think the same tracks that Jamie had are these ones. They crossed in here, probably went along this road, hit Tundam's road and just continued going east. So I don't think we're going to find this fellow on the end of these tracks, I'm afraid. But ooh, there might be another male lion, who knows? We're going to go towards Treehouse Dam now and see what's there. We are, of course, were waiting for this great deluge that is sure to arrive on Friday. And then Treehouse Dam will instead of being treehouse mud wallow, will turn into a great body of water in which water sports might be something we could do on a quiet game day. Who knows, some water skiing, VM. Would you like to barefoot ski in Treehouse Dam? Yes, yes, a water wally world. Very good idea. <laughs> we can come and do lengths. Yeah, the male lion does go down this road. They don't look that fresh to me, and I'll tell you why. I've just seen a millipede track over the top of the male lion. Millipedes do not walk, of course, in the night, so it's not to say that he didn't go very early morning, and then the millipede got up at dawn and walked across his tracks, but I think you'll find that these things are the same ones that Jamie had, and then the same ones that are being followed now on Torchwood. But maybe there'll be a brother on the damn wall. We're nearly there. Let's see. Things have got a little inclement. I haven't decided to put the roof on yet. I think that would be premature. But we have every so often 
Okay, let's head across to Steph on Bushwalker and find out if he's in his drainage line. One of my favorite things uh, out here in the bush is to lift up stumps and logs and see what's living underneath. And in this particular case, the shadow underneath this stump has, is home to two different animals that I want to show you. One is an assassin bug, which has managed to catch a termite and is busy eating a termite. Oh, there, there goes the assassin. I think we may have disturbed it. There's the assassin. You can see that little dark insect there. Now, assassins are bugs, proper bugs, belonging to the order Hemiptera. They have got this massively long proboscis that pierces the, the body of its victim. It then injects a whole bunch of toxins and digestive enzymes, kills whatever it stabbed, waits for the juices inside there to do its thing and then sucks out the body fluids of that hapless victim. Just something truly terrifying. If these things are as big as, who knows, buffalo, I don't think we'd be one of the preeminent species on the planet. The second thing I want to show you is the daddy long legs. Now quite often when we lift up these particular stumps, they are inhabited by violin spiders. And violin spiders and daddy long leg spiders are very easily confused with one another. But in this particular case, I'm able to show you the difference. Noticeably on that, on that spider are its white legs. Okay, there we go. There you can see it coming up there. So there's two there, but noticeably on that spider is the white knees and that funny swaying gait. So on this, at this angle, you can see those white legs. That is a daddy long legs. Violin spiders do not have those very conspicuous white legs. Now, I know that that might seem like, oh, every spider that I see with white legs I can touch or let my kids go near, but until you can really, really identify these spiders by habit, where they're sitting, how they look, how they're crouching, it's always advisable just to leave spiders alone. Don't go and kill them, that's not necessary. They help us with many, many things, in particular controlling what we consider pests, very good biological pest controllers are spiders. It doesn't mean we have to kill them all, but it, doesn't, it does help to identify them properly, and in this particular case, to know a harmless daddy long leg spider from a fairly dangerous violin spider. Uh, and we don't want to, you know, you don't want to get confused with that. Let's put this stump back here. And then I want to show you about a plant that I've just learned about out here. So now, we're all fairly common with the devil's thorn plant, uh, which is this one here, which gives us that nice shampoo or that nice soap. You add a little bit of water to it and it makes an incredibly nice um, soapy substance. Um, but what is less common is this plant. This is a wild sesame identified by its quite distinctive leaf. This is the sesame triphylum and this also has a nice soapy leaf and one of the very I mean I'm saying that sort of tongue-in-cheek over here we've only got two saponin containing plants here you add a little bit of water it just gets the whole process going and without too much effort you can see it making quite a gooey substance on my hands there and that's because it contains saponins, which you can use as a very effective soap. So we've got the devil's thorn here, which we create a soap from, a shampoo. And we've got the sesame plant that we also create soap from. But not only is the sesame plant used for, for soap making, these stems, when they dried, make incredibly tough, um, uh, basically like rattan vines. And Doors, quite often doors and baskets are weaved from these stems. Now, they're used by men and women for different things. Uh, women walk around chewing the roots. It is a great reliever for menstrual cramps. So women walk around uh, chewing the roots of this particular plant. Men will take this leaf and throw it into milk, which immediately curdles the milk. And they will then drink the curdled milk um, and it's said to be a very powerful aphrodisiac. 
Now, I don't quite know whether I want to give that a bash this morning. This, I've got this fly that is being determined to fly into my ear hole. Mm. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, and so the, the men in the local communities out here will put this into milk in a curdled mixture they'll drink. And, uh, I, you know, whether it works or not, I won't be able to tell you this morning. <laughs> but anyway, but a very good, um, and a very good plant for menstrual cramps uh, in women. As well as a soapy soap substitute and quite a lot of saponins in just one leaf, I must be honest with you. The best way is just to wipe it off. And they leave your hands. My, my hands are never in very good condition. They're always red, scraped, got holes in, bits and pieces of thorns. But I do quite enjoy having clean hands and having sort of soap growing everywhere out here helps me with that particular compulsion. All right, onward we go. It's proving to be a great walk so far. Are you enjoying yourself, David? All right, and while I get myself all packed up and off to the next wonder, let me go see what Jamie's been keeping herself busy with. <laughs> so while Steph packs up, we've stopped to listen to one very angry squirrel. And we are, of course, completely 100% live, so I'm looking to see whether or not either a leopard or a lion has a, perhaps provoked this particular squirrel. Very important to listen to all the sounds of the vegetation in the bush. Now, let's see, what's wrong, little squirrel? You're very cross about something. Squirrels are tricky, though. Oh, now he's gone quiet. No, he's still cross. Don't you think it sounds a lot like a witch cackling? <laughs> what is wrong? What is happening? Brian, can you still see it? I didn't see it at all. Oh, you didn't see it at all. No, I'm... Oh, I thought perhaps you'd seen it. I'm completely blind. I know he's calling from somewhere. What is wrong? I'm very upset. One very, very upset squirrel. I might just go poke my nose over there just in case. The problem with squirrels at the moment is, as Brian pointed out, there are so many birds of prey flying around enjoying the termites that he might just be calling it that. But he could be calling it a snake, could be calling it a mongoose, could be calling it a leopard. Yes, yes, I know. What's the matter? What have you seen? What is wrong? Now you've seen me and you've gone quiet. What is down here? That's a kingfisher. Where, where are you? What, what is the matter? Are you shouting at, are you shouting at another squirrel or something? He's very upset. I still can't see it. I have no idea where it is. I can hear it. What has got you so cross? Oh, furious. I don't see a snake. I don't see, I don't see anything. I don't know what on earth has got the squirrel so thoroughly cross with life. It does sound like a witch cackling though. What have you seen? Have you seen our lion by any chance? It is a frantic call. Um, squirrels have obviously different stages of alarm calling depending on what it is they've seen. And this one sounds furious. This is the last place where we thought Karula might have run to from those baboons. It could well be her. But I didn't see anything in there. What did your sharp little eyes see that mine have not? Another squirrel, perhaps. They do also make that sound at other squirrels, but there's no second squirrel calling, which makes me wonder. Hmm. Oh, it's not just snakes and leopards that squirrel alarm call at. They also like to shout to the rooftops when there is a bird around. Let's go and have a look at which one James has found. 
They do indeed, you know, and it's not unusual to find schoolers' alarm calling like that, be convinced that there is a leopard in the offing, and then looking to the sky, and suddenly you will see a bird flying along, an African hawk eagle perhaps, or, like this one, a Wahlberg's eagle. Now, the Wahlberg's eagle says in its little sort of write-up, that they eat largely other birds. I think I've told you quite a lot that they eat lizards and things. Well, they do. But they will also eat small mammals like the squirrels. And certainly, when I have seen squirrels around about Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg's nest, that's the one where the pale form Wahlbergs live just below our camp, the squirrels go absolutely mad when those two birds move around, so clearly they are some sort of danger to squirrels. Now I'm just going to sit here while we observe this magnificent fellow here. Um, well, while we sit and watch him, let me just tell you, hashtag Safari Live, of course, is how you're going to get hold of us, ask us questions, give us your comments, what you think of this Wahlberg's eagle. And I do find that he looks rather miserable in this weather. He had, when we found him, he was hunched over. And, of course, these eagles look very cross all the time, I find. No eagle ever looks like it's having a particularly cheerful day. So I am correct, 40% reptiles seems to be their diet. Sometimes it will even take birds and bats in flight. That's very impressive. Now we're about to go off for a short break. But fear not, we're going to sit with this thing. This, gee, this is what he was doing. He's looking hunched over. He's perhaps spotted something on the ground. Right, we're going for our short break. We're not going to go anywhere. We're going to sit right here with this eagle and see if he doesn't dive down and grab something on the ground. See you shortly. Hello, everybody in Adbreg. All right, we're just going to carry on now. Like I say, thank you for bearing with us during those practices. It is very important for us. And I think he is probably trying to spot something on the ground to eat. But he does look so very cross with the weather. And who can blame him? And we were just saying, Vim and I, we thought maybe he was a juvenile on account of the fact that he has got um, that sort of whitish patch you can see behind his eye on the, on the plumage. And it's not unusual for a juvenile bird to be slightly mottled. So perhaps this is his first year back. Perhaps this is his first return and he doesn't have a nest yet. And that's why he's sitting a little bit miserably on his own. Don't worry, you'll find a partner one day. All is not lost. I know these are lonely times, but soon you will find a friend, and you two will build an uncomfortable stick nest in which you will return every single year when you return from North Africa. Right, that is the Wahlberg's Eagle. Let's head across further that way towards Twin Dams and just see if there isn't something more in the offing there. There is a nest there and I wonder, this might be one of those, one or one of the eagles from that nest, but I think he's a juvenile. I found no tracks further, I'm afraid, of any kind of uh, large game or cat. And like I say, the Ninkapumas definitely on Elephant Plains. I think they've killed something, but it's quite nice for us for our TV show coming up, simply because what it means is that if they have killed something, it's quite possible that they will come, they'll start to move again. So they've killed a buffalo or something, they'll finish it, I think, probably today, and then definitely tomorrow evening I'll start moving around. So that at least this evening they'll start moving around, and so tomorrow maybe they'll be here. That would be very nice indeed. Now, let me just turn off here. I thought I heard a squirrel alarm calling. No, I didn't. Sorry, Vimpy. Let's carry on. Oh, 
We'll go down to the dam, see if there are any waterfowl there, and then head on to the far eastern boundary. But there's lovely bird song going on here. There's a rattling cysticula up there. There we are. Isn't that cool? Black cuckoo. Ring neck dove. Southern black tit. Beautiful. Let's see if we can catch the southern black tit. Often, you know, where there are southern black tits, there's a bird party, which means maybe there's a flush of insects that's come through here and they're all kind of eating together. And I don't know why it is, but they seem to like to follow the southern black tit. He's in here somewhere. Maybe he doesn't have a nest close by. Orange-breasted bushrike. Southern black tit's gone into the drainage there. And then a Franklin down in the drainage. You can just maybe hear it echoing through there. And we're about to go back to fake TV, everyone. So excuse my strange recap that I will give you about the things you've just seen. <laughs> There's the Wahlberg's nest I was talking about, but that seems to be relatively unoccupied this year. About to go back to TV, everybody. Welcome back, everybody, to your live safari. The still blankets us. We're on the hunt for cats with any luck. Spot a leopard track or two. Jamie has gone off to the north. She's also looking for a couple of cat tracks. And Steph, as you've seen, is looking underneath the rocks and the logs and seeing if he can find some of the smaller things for you. He too will be scouring the ground for tracks of any of the cats. Wonderful. Steph has found a rock. Steph has found a rock with eight legs and a bunch of eyes on the front of his head. Exactly true. What you're looking at there is a spider I've only recently learned how to recognize. This is a sand diving spider and they really, really enjoy termites. This group of spiders scurry around looking for termites and have the ability of staying hidden by flicking sand over their bodies and just keeping that cone-like head of theirs outside of the sand and then scurrying away with them to eat them. Free ground living spiders, a couple of different species here. This is the largest of them and with yesterday's termite emergence uh, across pretty much the whole of Juma, he is very full. You can see that fat abdomen of theirs. But in us coming down to the spiders level and really into this eat or be eaten world that they live in, we've managed to see three different organisms that are hiding in plain sight. Now, that little spider is one of them, looking like a mobile rock. I'm gonna be pointing at another one that is gonna astound young David here next to me. I'm gonna put my stick at the end of this, oh, it jumped away. 
All right, so I won't show you that one. <laughs> I was a little bit too hasty there. But um, what I am going to show you now is an, uh, another insect that's hiding in plain sight. This one, so that it can get close to its victims, not stay away from becoming food. Come around this side of this stump. Come and have a look over here. Have a look at the end of the stick. That stick has got six legs, four of which are used to walk with, two of which have been modified into grappling hooks, spears, spines, and harpoons. That is an inch long stick-like mantis, or stick mantis. Having a bit of a panic, looking at itself reflected in the lens of the camera and trying its best to wave in the wind to look like a stick or a piece of grass. Isn't that just amazing? Look at those body movements. I mean, how does it know how to do that? Just thousands of years of evolution has just taught it that's what it has to do. I just find these types of creatures incredible. In my mind, I'm blowing them up to be as big as leopard and lion. And then they become even more wonderful than what they are. Just look at that slight weave. Now, one thing I've been noticing about these praying mantids is that they're actually not scared of hunting spiders and other predators that can do them some significant harm if they were to be caught out by one. And almost always they approach from a 45 degree angle from the rear and catch them on the abdomen, keeping the jaws away from themselves. It's just one of these hunting techniques that I've noted. Now that is the one amazing animal. And before I show you the next one, I just want to remind you that this show is interactive and that you can contact us on a variety of different platforms. Um, you can use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter to get hold of us, but you can also use an email address, thequestions at wildearth.tv, and just send in a general comment. It doesn't have to be a question about what we're seeing. You can comment on the weather, you can make a comment about something similar that you've perhaps seen in the natural environment around your home or on a holiday. You know, just have a, have a chat to us. It's always good to hear from you, and as much as possible. Now I'm going to show you the next one. Dave, you're gonna, I'm going to move the stick out the way and hopefully I don't scare this whatever it is. Actually, I know what it is, but I'm going to get the disruption out of the way. So, sitting underneath this stick. Oh, <laughs> no. All right, that is a lesson that I need to learn at the moment is that grasshoppers have much better vision than what you give them credit for. And they're almost always jumping away. Let me see if I can get this guy to jump back here. Hold on. Let's see if we can get him to jump back. There we go. Have a look at that guy. He's moving now and across the grain of the tree, which means that it's easy to see. But if he turned literally the other way around, 90 degrees to what he's doing at the moment, he would be just as invisible as that praying mantis and that spider. Just look at that. One of the mantis mantids that are living pretty much on these dark pieces of wood and bark, probably just venturing to the grass just adjacent to these trees and feeding on the leafy material or the grass material, staying hidden and out of sight in plain view. And that is a very good strategy for an insect. Mainly because the fact is that as long as you stay hidden, lots of things, lots of predators won't see you, won't hunt at you. Um, but something that isn't staying hidden is James, who seems to be on a birding day all of his own today. Why don't you go see what bird he's got to show you? Oh, don't fly. It's the same one. Well, it's not the same bird, but it's the same species as the one we saw earlier. It's a juvenile Wahlbergs. Oh, very nice. Is now much lighter than he was when we first saw him. 
There he goes. And the reason we th I can tell that he's juvenile is just on account of that mottled feathering. Now, I don't know if you heard there, but as he flew, another bird further down went... Da -da 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 -da. There was alarm calling at him. So they are bird eaters as well. Um, and we have seen a few other raptors around here. I think maybe there's been some kind of termite emergence. Just about all of these raptors will eat termites because they are such very good nutrition. That's to the south of where we're allowed to go. So we're going to head further north now. And there was a slight smell of death in the air here. And I thought maybe Kurula would have... Maybe she's sitting on a carcass somewhere around here. But... There's so many expired buffalo from the drought that normally when you smell death, it's a buffalo that um, has passed on on account of a lack of water. Right, on to Ledwood Road. Let's see what we can find this end of the world. Maybe some more frogs and things. I'd really like to see a few more frogs. Bushfield rain frog is the only frog that I've seen this year. Steph's had a bit more luck. I don't know if he told you about the bullfrog he found yesterday. That was very special. He found it just coming out of the sand. And it was hilarious to watch uh, this thing kind of, you know, it's, they're a bit like a bear coming out of hibernation. It takes him a while to warm up, to kind of get going for their metabolisms to kick in and so this frog was sort of sitting there looking at him out of the top of its eyes almost unable to move and that's what happens of course when the metabolism is waking up it takes a little bit of time before they're actually able to produce enough energy to start moving around the place and so I think it probably thought Steph was going to try and eat it and it was sort of sitting there cowering a little bit and Steph um, <laughs> almost as if to try and comfort the frog, just ran his finger along the back of it as if to say, it's okay, it's all right, I'm not going to try and eat you. I like to think the frog relaxed then, but I, I'm not convinced it had that effect. Huge thing, it was about that big. Hmm. All righty, let's see what else we can find. We've got a lot of... Um, cloud at the moment it is getting very dark but I don't think it's going to rain too much today I'm glad that we haven't put our rain cover on and Liz yes you're absolutely correct we are starting to see oh don't move we are starting to see the pans filling up certainly and that's where the frogs are likely to be. There was a diker in there. But it is hidden and gone. There it goes, as the camera moved off it. They really are not blessed of great courage, I wouldn't say. They're almost universally irritating when you spot them. So let's, yes, the pans, the natural pans, which are depressions of clay-rich soil, are definitely filling up with water. We've had, I don't know, I think we've probably had this year so far, I'm going to say round about 100 millimetres of rain or so. 100 millimetres is roughly four inches or so of rain. If you want to work it out exactly, you can. Uh, it's 10 centimetres of rain. One centimetre is 2.47. At least one inch is 2.47 centimetres. If you don't mind, I'm just going to round it off to two and a half. There is the Dica again. Yes, we see you now. Oh no, that's not the same one. See him trying to smell us? This is a male, the other one was female. Very fleet of foot. Hmm. It's like watching Viam run. I've seen you run. I've seen you run once, I think, Viam. I think it was when you thought that lunch was going to be finished before you could get there. Then I, then I almost saw you run. There's another big raptor up ahead. I suspect one of the batelieux that like to live in this area. There we are. It is indeed. 
il est batteleur. Look at that very distinctive flight. See that? Very shallow wing beats. And even at a hundred miles, well, not quite a hundred miles, but even if you could just see the flapping of a tiny black speck in the background of the sky, that flight pattern is so completely distinctive. Very shallow wing beats. Not wanting to hang around and say hello to us, I'm afraid. And the vultures, of course, will be much more reticent to take off than the Wahlbergs, Eagles and the Bataliers because they, of course, are much heavier and their lives are therefore dictated to by the amount of heat that rises off the ground in the way of thermals. Not as teeming out here, isn't it, Vim? I mean, I hardly know where to look next. Great swathes of antelope streaming across the plains. Elephants crashing through the bushes. Lions devouring buffalo around every corner. Leopards dripping from the trees. Oh, there's another battalier then, quickly before it flies. It's in the tree, in the middle of the tree. It's decided it's seeking shelter there. There we are. That's Mr. Mrs. has got more of that greyish colour that he's got on his shoulder. She's got more of that down on the lower parts of her wings. Now, this is almost certainly the other half of the pair. No, it can't be, in fact. That's interesting. The one that we saw earlier was also a male. Just doing a bit of preening before work. One must look one's best when one goes to work on a Wednesday morning, Vim. Hmm. Beautiful red head. And uh, the sky really does make it difficult to see nice colours. The leaden sky of this cold front. The prelude to the deluge. Looks quite ominous, doesn't it? Hmm. Well, I'm glad I'm not on the sea in weather like this. Glad I'm not on the sea, full stop. <clears throat> right, Jamie has managed to find herself a tree hole in which a bird is with another bird. I'll look very, very closely because we have indeed, as James so eloquently described it, have a tree hole with a bird in it. Look very closely at the bottom of this particular hole and you'll see some sort of white debris there. Now that is defecation from a female hornbill and her chicks. And if you wait, there we go, here we go. There you go, did you see the beak there? <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was mom or if that was babies, but it is another perfect example of just what a reliable provider the male yellow-billed hornbill is, and the red-billed hornbill, and the ground hornbill, actually. Um, all of all hornbills nest in the same way, and the female goes in for her period of confinement where she loses all of her feathers and she lays her eggs, not all of her feathers, all of her primary flight feathers, she lays her eggs and once the chicks um, hatch she starts to grow her feathers back and she breaks back out of the hole and helps the male to provide for them. So that was what that was the process we saw there and I'm going to wait for another moment because he's proved to be very reliable this particular hornbill and I'm hoping he's going to bring back some more food and maybe we can see again whether or not those were tiny little beaks poking out or if perhaps it was the female. Amazing what close attention they're paying inside the hole to whenever the hornbill lands, although I suppose you would when you... There we go, there we go. What you got? Oh, and off again. That was very badly timed wind. <laughs> Regular as clockwork. Oh, look, it's a little baby hornbill. <laughs> Sorry. 
try and tone it down a little bit. One very ugly, very tiny hornball stuck its head out there. I'm not sure whether any of you managed to get a screenshot of that. It was so fast. Baby birds are not pretty things, unless they're precocial chicks. They tended to be relatively unpleasant to look at. That was a very wrinkly... They look like old... They look old when they're young like that. Their skin's all wrinkly. That bill was barely developed. Let's wait and see if our hornbill returns. He's going to. Luckily for him, with the rains, <coughs> excuse me, with the rains, as you've seen with Steph, the place is teeming with insect life. And that means all the more for this particular hornbill's growing family. I don't think the female's in there anymore. So in fact, we could be looking at the combined efforts of the male and the female hornbill. Because I don't think she's still there. I think the fact that the little chicks are poking their heads out already suggests to me that they're big enough for her to be out again. Such an innocuous little spot. Completely hidden away and essentially safe from most predators. The biggest threat will be a snake. If a snake were to discover that hole, it would have an absolute field day. And perhaps a gymnogene, yes, probably a gymnogene or a harrier hawk would be able to reach in there. But other than that, it is perfectly, perfectly hidden. We're going to stick around and stake out this particular hole. In the meantime, James has got an animal that is moving away from him at high speed. There is the speaks hinged tortoise. You see, it heard me say its name, Vim, so it stopped moving. Oh, no, it actually got stuck on a stick. Now, ago, when we witnessed a great fight between two male speaks-hinged tortoises, they were very cross with each other, and they had an enormous battle that went on for about 40 minutes. This one, I think, is a female on account of the fact that she doesn't seem to have that spiky scoot at the bottom underneath her tail. Now, scoot is one of those sort of hexagonal pieces of the shell there. It's called a scoot. And the females tend to have a bigger gap at the back, allowing the male access. And that's really how we tell. Oh, turning towards us. Do you think she's trying to flank us, Vim? I think, I think she is. She's, she's preparing to charge. There we go, look now, she's sneaking underneath that stick, trying to get a good view of us. Oh, goodness, she's very stealthy, this tortoise, doing a great circle. <laughs> Getting a little bit stuck on the thorns. she comes. I think she's rather special. I don't know really what her objective is here. So she was on the road. We stopped here. She turned around. She went completely the other way. Then she went round behind that stick and now she seems to be almost on her way out again. Now you read, of course, that these things are great devourers of, devourers of land snails, but it is my abiding wish that one day I should see one eating a land snail. I'm just quickly going to consult my book here, because I'm pretty sure that's what I've read. It's definitely what I've told many of you for much time. Oh, hang on a second. There, that's who I am. There we go. I just had to uh, turn to the camera, just in case you'd forgotten who I was. And again, that's part of our practicing for TV. I'm just trying to find the snails. If you'll bear with me one second. Spiders and other arachnids, lower invertebrates. It's, you know, a snail, you know, is known as a lower invertebrate. There's, uh, no man, I don't want these. I want the tortoises. They're, of course, are reptiles. I'm making a complete hash of this. Wait one second. I will find them, I promise. Here we go, here we go. 
Speaks Hingeback. There we go. Four, sorry. There we are. Um, Fran, I did wait for the tortoise battle to play out. They eat fungi, snails, millipedes and plants. There we go. Fungi, snails, millipedes and plants. And Fran, uh, it was interesting. We started sort of narrating it like it was a, a cage fight at the end because, oh, there is actually a snail there. The MEC over the top. Ooh, what? A dwarf mongoose. Okay, let's have a look at that. I think that's a snail there. Fran, um, just over the top of the car, there's a white patch. You see it there? Fran, I, the smaller one actually seemed to win, which I think was very strange. It was slightly lighter and slightly smaller. But no one actually died as a result. And I think that was quite by luck because one of the, the bigger one was nearly turned onto his back three or four times. So that was quite interesting. Maybe that tortoise is trying to flank that snail. All right, let's see if we can find the dwarf mongoose. Can you still see it there? There's the movement. It's just in this somewhere. You sure that's a dwarf mongoose? Yes, it is indeed. It doesn't really want to see us, I'm afraid. And I can just hear it making a very slight contact call to its friends. Dink, dink, dink. Right, as we move on, Jamie is still with that hornbill's nest. Let's find out what's happening there. I am still with the hornbill's nest or at the it seems as though mum or dad are having a hard time picking up the groceries right now because there have not been any further visits since you left us. And the poor little chicks are going hungry. Mum and dad had better hurry back with something delectable like a squishy caterpillar or something similar. Well, I'm still waiting patiently because I want you... I don't know if we're going to be able to hear it because the wind is gusting. But when they do feed their chicks, as soon as they arrive, you can actually start, if you listen carefully, you can start to hear the begging, squeaking calls of the hornbill chicks themselves. Come on, Mom and Dad. And a good morning to Sally, while we look at the hole, not relatively, um, boring looking hole in the tree. Sally would like to know if the hornbills will build that nest themselves. Oh, I think I saw mum for a second. Let me just see. No. We'll get there. We'll get there. We just have to be patient. Uh, Sally wants to know if they, if, the, if they will basically take over a hole in a tree or if they will excavate it themselves. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yay! Oh. Landed at the tree, the marula tree behind it. Hold on, it's, it's coming. It'll come. It's just there. As Sally Hornbill generally don't to make it more comfortable for them, um, they won't actually excavate their own nesting hole. So they will find a hollow. And it's usually in marula trees, just because marula tree wood tends to be quite soft. That is a good meal for a baby. It looks absolutely massive. I can't see what it is. But it definitely looks as though it's going to be something that the, the chicks are going to wolf down. Might even be a little bit big for them. I wonder if that's what this hornbill's thinking about. Whether or not the chicks are going to be able to handle a meal that large. So there are birds that do excavate. Oh, <laughs> surprise! There we go, there's mom. So mom and dad are now providing for the chicks. So mom has got her flight feathers back. That was mom, the one we were looking at previously was dad. I can just tell just by the thickness of the bill. There's a subtle difference. There's dad looking slightly cold and grumpy. It's been a long morning for our harried parents. 
Now, there are birds that excavate their own nests, barbets and woodpeckers and kingfishers are among the birds that do do that. And they will also, birds will also reuse, oh I thought he dropped it for a second, will also reuse the same nesting sites. <laughs> I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder if he's going through a crisis of conscience right now. On the one hand, hungry mouths to feed, on the other, he might actually be quite hungry. Yeah, nope, none for you little ones. <laughs> Sorry, Dad's decided no such luck. Now, if these little chicks are successfully raised to adulthood, they will actually grow up and probably help their parents out with the next generation. So, for the next few weeks, they will be being they will be fed by their parents, even once they have fledged. Once they reach the point where they are able to get their own food, what they'll do is they will go and they'll help mom and dad collect for the next generation. So hornbills, if they breed early in the season, as they have this year, then they could have a second clutch of eggs. So who knows? Good luck to our hornbill family. In the meantime, let's head over to James to find out what his plans are. Right, there's a stern book there, everybody. I'm reticent to start the car, but it's got something very wrong with its right eye. It really is quite gruesome. I mean, is it... What, is that something stuck in its eye? Try and get my binoculars out. I don't want to start the car simply because I think you'll run. Ugh. What do you think, Vim? Do you think it's something sticking out of the eye? Or perhaps out of the preorbital gland. So we know that the Stirnbok, of course, has that gland uh, just in front of the eye that they use to mark territory, and you can see it there. So maybe that's something wrong with the gland. Maybe he's, I've always thought it's the most tremendously risky place to have a gland. Maybe he's kind of picked it out slightly or damaged it while he was marking territory, stuck his head onto the wrong kind of stick. There we go. Oh, stop running away. Now, other side. Turn, turn, turn the other way. You probably can't see out the other side. He really knows how to hide it, doesn't he? Come on, here we go. Uh. How very interesting. Crazy-eyed Willy, yes, I think we can call him Crazy-eyed Willy, if that's what you'd like to call him then. There's old Crazy-eyed Willy. He just will not hold that part of his head still. Very strange. Hmm. Oh well. So maybe a growth out of the preorbital gland, maybe actually out of the eye itself. I suspect he's injured at mar marking territory a little bit too aggressively. Reminds me of a rather macabre story that I'll tell you now. Um, it has a relatively happy ending. Uh, but once when I was working at Londolozi down south of where we are now, I was working as the sort of conservation guy. I wasn't guiding. And there was a radio call, a tremendous emergency. Half the team, the conservation team was out, or the habitat team was out in the field clearing bushes. And one guy had 
he was picking bush uh, logs up and as he went down to pick one up he impaled his eye on a stick and then of course as your reaction normally is vm has gone pale what your reaction would normally be there is to lift your eye quickly of course because um you, you want to get away from the pain and it was totally kind of automatic reaction and unfortunately he left half of his eye on the stick Vim has now been sick over the side of the car anyway I rushed this chap to hospital and um, on the way there we were stopped by a traffic officer who told me I was speeding I just opened the window and pointed at Lucky who moved his eye sli his hand slightly away from his eye like this the traffic officer went roughly the same color as Vim has gone now and we sped off. Anyway, he lost the eye eventually and they put a glass eye in and it didn't affect him hugely. He managed to carry on doing his job. But the funniest part of the story is that in the winter time, he'd wear a full balaclava. But of course, because he couldn't see out of his left eye, he sewed the, he sewed the, um, <laughs> the left eye socket shut so he'd drive along and you just see this one eye moving through the bush in the dusk light in the in the car which was quite amusing at the time i suppose the story behind it isn't very funny though is this where your hornbill is uh, uh, over there i came on leadwood yes in that case we shall take mamba take good take mamba yes Hello, Brian. Hello, James. How lovely to see you. How lovely to see you as well. I have no doubt the viewers are most pleased with the view of your face. <laughs> Could you give us your most special smile? That is exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, on we go. Right, let's head across to Link. Let's head across to Jamie and Brian so that Jamie might give you a very special smile of her own. <laughs> Brian, that was a lovely smile. <laughs> Brian's still killing himself laughing. <laughs> ah. It's a pity we didn't get a VM smile as well. We could have completed the completed the morning. I wonder if James is going to encounter our hornbill nest. I wonder if he'll find it. It's a bit tricky to find if you don't see the hornbill going in. Oh look, a speaks hinge tortoise. No, that's not a speaks hinge tortoise, that's a rock. Right, well we're going to be taking a short break now. If you want to see what other mystical things I can see in the form of logs or rocks, stay tuned and join us shortly after the break. What shall we sell, Bebop? Hmm. Uh, soap. Soap. <laughs> <laughs> a gear, a d we should get Steph to do an advert. Do you need hand sanitizer wherever you go and whatever you do? <laughs> or alternatively, water purification tablets? Ho, 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 it's Christmas time. Please go shop at shop.wildearth.tv. This is a genuine advert. If you were to do so, you would find mugs and tote bags. What is a tote bag? I still don't quite know what a tote bag is, Brian. Is it a tog bag? Tote bag, mug, t-shirt, hoodie. You can find all sorts of things at shop.wildearth.tv. The proceeds will be involved in sending us on great adventures and taking you all along for the ride. So if you would like to go and join us on a boat in the Delta or in Zambia or Rwanda, that is the way to help us along. So there you go. Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas shopping. I think that's actually the shop finishes today. I'm not entirely sure because I haven't kept track of the days. But I think the shop is done today. So hurry and visit and buy something. Right, moving swiftly on from that, your commercial messages. Um, let's see what else we can find in the form of nature. <laughs> Siberia Zumi has requested Brian to provide a 
commercial jingle. Can you think of a commercial jingle, Bebop? No, I can't. No, oh, I know. It's, it's quite difficult off pat like that. What would be a commercial jingle? You know, the only jingle I can think of, which is an advert from, South, I think it's only in South Africa that we get it, or Southern Africa, is the Bathroom Bazaar advert. That's B-I-Z-A-R-R-E. Yeah, no, that's the only commercial jingle that I can think of. <laughs> or alternatively, Joshua Dor. These are the jingles that we remember from one's childhood. Rebecca, do you remember the Bathroom Bazaar advert? It was incredibly annoying. <laughs> Rebecca says no, she's too young. <laughs> well, since we appear to be absent of animals and absent of inspiration for Christmas jingles, I mean commercial jingles, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, let's go over to James who has a heartbeat. I think that I am going to have words with Jamie Patterson when I get home, and that is because the bathroom bazaar jingle is quite possibly the most offensive uh, jingle I've ever heard in my days. Did she sing it for you? So, so horrendous of all the jingles in the world and what really distresses me is that someone was paid for that absolute load of complete dross now let's go a little bit forward these could do are quite special they're just ruminating quietly on the ground and i'm kind of much like with the steenbock reticent to make them get up i'll just stop here there we go We're about to go back to fake TV, everybody. See? Got a fright. What? Going to vomit into its mouth? Maybe we can have an action replay of that when we get back to TV. Welcome back, everyone, to your morning's live safari. We have seen, well, a great variety of things today. Those are some kudu over there. Jamie is still looking for cats on the southern boundary and Steph is scouring the landscape for more tracks and, of course, the reptiles and insects and frogs that he's been finding throughout the course of the morning. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live. It's the best way to get hold of us. We love hearing from you and tell us where you're from when you talk to us. Let's go straight back to these kudu here. There you are, everybody. We're now in full TV, as you can see. And that kudu is ruminating. And I don't mean it's considering life, I mean it is genuinely... ...grinding, grinding the leaves that it's been eating probably since the dawn broke this morning. Put them into, or stored them in the first stomach. And now, when that swallows, it'll go into the second stomach. And the process of fermentation will begin. Now, watch. <laughs> I probably see it uses me every single time. And then to the left, there's a few more of them sort of behind the bushes also doing their morning ruminations. There we are. Oh, we'll get to see it twice, Fiam. Watch. Here we go. This time from the side. Side vomit and go. There we are. Excellent. <laughs> This is a really, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a group of kudu like this lying on the ground, completely relaxed around us. And I'm actually so impressed by them that I'm not going to continue down this road. I'm going to turn around and go the other way because they'll almost certainly get up and move off if I drive past them. And I feel that would be really rather unkind. 
They seem to be very happy on the ground there. They've had a cold and nasty morning and now they're just quietly enjoying their breakfast for the second time. And most pleased I've no doubt they are that whatever it is that they're re, re chewing right now is probably green and nutritious as opposed to brown and fairly unnutritious. Let's hope they have a plan for the deluge for them. Oh, look at the ominous sky. Okay, let's carry on. We're going to turn around. I do not wish to frighten those kudus. Steph he is also out, as you know, and he has now got a coleoptrid to show you. And that terrifying visage is the face of a longhorn beetle. One of the largest of the longhorn beetles that we find out here and well represented by this fantastically massive family of insects. There is so many different kinds of longhorn beetles, but this one is the first of its kind I've ever seen. And it's come out of the wood, not stuck or anything, and it's just cold. They get their energy from the environmental temperature, and it's actually quite chilly right now, and I think it's just come out of the wood and gotten a bit freezing and just decided that it'll stick around here and watch whoever's coming down this path. Let me show you why it's called a longhorn beetle. <coughs> Excuse me, just clearing my throat there. It has these beautifully long antennae with which it has... There we go, have a look at that. Let me get his long horns out. There we go. Framing his face. <laughs> There's the long horns of the longhorn beetle. Just have a look at that. Those mandibles, how sharp are they? Pointed. Not wanting to slice through the stick today, but nevertheless, terrifying anyway. Doesn't that look like something out of a science fiction movie? And David doing a spectacular job keeping it filled up. I must say, this sudden cold snap has given us two different beetles. I have in my hand here something that I've just picked up as well while. I was speaking to you. I've always enjoyed these jewel beetles from uh, from the fam from the insect order book press today, and this is one I've never seen before. This royal blue one. Just have a look at the colours on these things. Isn't it incredible? Now, I do know some of these. Well, these beetles are traded quite heavily. Uh, across the world in their dry form, making up the basis of insect collections. And I know some of the rarer ones will go for $5,000 or so, just for a beetle. Not that I'm condoning any of that sort of trade, by the way. I think it's abhorrent. Very pretty, though. Let's see if his wing covers open. This one is dead, so I suppose it won't mind if I open up the wings. Quite often the colours underneath the wings are even more spectacular. Oops, okay. The covers underneath the wings are even more spectacular. So they're the elytra, the insects have got four wings, two hard ones, What's happening with me today? Two hard ones that cover the soft flying wings. Open it there for you. There's his back. So this one doesn't have a great diversity of color on the back. Some of them are proper gold and scarlet. So there you go. There's its flying wings with its hard fused elytra. 
arguably prettier on the bottom, hey? Fantastic iridescence. Very, very awesome. Alrighty. Nice. We're going to carry on and look for some more wonders. Jamie is driving around in the Mulwati. Driving in the Mulwati and we've come across such a lovely sight on this cloudy morning in the form of seven Nyala bulls. Did I count that right? I did. There's definitely seven of them moving about here. So a really lovely bachelor herd that's moving about in this group. And I wonder perhaps whether or not they'd be able to tell us if Karula came through here. Because this is why I've come in here to try just one last ditch attempt to see if we can't pick up on any footprints. But to me, all seven of them looking perfectly relaxed. Most of them are young. They're roughly the same age. They've got their first half twist of their horns, but they haven't quite reached the full size of a big bull. There we go, this one just a little bit older, starting to get the white tips to his horns, looking a lot darker and a lot more solid than the one we saw before. And in fact, there's only really one big bull, and he is the gentleman standing a little way apart from the rest on the right. It's a beautiful place to sit on a morning like this morning, listening to the various bird calls and just enjoying the atmosphere. This really is a lovely spot. It would be lovelier if Karula decided to come wandering through, but for now we'll make do with one of the most attractive antelope that we see out here. Here we go, that's the big bull. His horns have nearly reached their full size. Actually, the horns are in my opinion, slightly less dangerous at when an Inyala bull is this age than when they're younger. And that's just because they're a slightly better shape. They're not sharp little daggers sticking out of the top of a bull's head. I once upon a time, many years ago, when was on holiday with my family and it was in an area where obviously the, the Inyala were very accustomed to people and so much so that I think they'd been fed by hand a great deal. And we looked up the one day and an Inyala bull had walked into the kitchen, which I have to tell you is quite a surprise. It's the last thing you expect when you, you're on holiday and you're in the little cottage that we were in and all of a sudden an Inyala bull walks into, in through your door and into the kitchen. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what to do because they're quite big. I mean, they really are very big and they're very strong and they're probably quite dangerous and you don't really want a cornered Nyala bull in the kitchen. So I, at, at a loss as to what to do, I got closer and closer to this thing and it just calmly blinked at me. It wasn't scared at all. And eventually it got to the point where I was holding its horns thinking this is a very bad idea, but I don't quite know what else to do. And we sort of, I just gently pushed him out of the door. And in hindsight, that was very stupid. Um, because he actually, even by mistake, without intending to hurt me, he could have just done that. And that might have resulted in a, ah, here's the rain, Brian. He's put our rain cover on, our raincoat on the camera, because the rain is... Quick. <laughs> Covers on. Here we go. Bye-bye, everybody. Hello, everybody. covering up all manner of non-waterproof items. I'm trapped, I'm caught in my... Here we go again. I thought we were gonna make it to the end of the safari without getting drenched, Ryan. Uh, we were so close. We were. we were so close, but it is not to be. Have you got your rain pants here? No. Oh no! Oh dear, this is most tragic. <laughs> Now, James, you want to know if this rainfall is normal for this time of year. Yes, it is. Uh, this is actually normal, typical summer pattern rainfall. I still think we're going to have a bad year for rain. That's just my instinct, is that we're not going to get our usual amounts. We'll know in a couple of months. Obviously, we'll know in a couple of months. I, what usually happens, in my experience out here in this particular area with rainfall, is around January or February, you get two weeks of solid rain. 
just constant downpour. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in an area that experienced a half of its annual average rainfall in two days. That was serious rain. So yes, it is. It's it's. This is a normal summer rainfall pattern. Hot, hot, hot days turning into storms. And then gentle drizzle for two days. It's great. It, it is perfect for this time of year and very good news. It starts to rain. Let's go and see what Steph is up to. We also are hiding out underneath the pelter forum from the rain. I must be honest with you, just trying to keep everything dry while we put on the rain covers and get everything sorted out. I'm sure Jamie and, and James will be back in a second. But what is interesting is this little patch of ground. I'll come and show you exactly what it is now. Is holding one of my favorite little sedges. I love these little bushes. It's like a, it's a sedge here that has just come through the bushes and the grass over here. It grows with this little white head at the top. And it, yep. And has this almost onion-like base. But when you squeeze this and you release some of the juices on the inside, Oh, it has the most wonderfully refreshing smell. It's like a minty freshness, like fresh summer rain smell. It just is the smell of summer for me and holds quite a lot of antibacterial properties. In actual fact, a stop to plug ostrich egg water containers and it imparts a lovely, it imparts a lovely sort of um, oh, smell that it imparts to the water, but it also stops the water from going stale. It, it, uh, it helps the water stay fresh and pure, and so you can use it in that sense. I just like to smell it and just think of summer. Oh, it really is amazing. All right, you're going to be going off to an ad break in the next couple of seconds. When you come back, we will have our rain covers on. Hopefully, I've found you something else to have a look at. Yes. Oh. Now we are hiding out underneath this wattle tree. This is one of the trees that we can use just to get out of the rain a little bit. It doesn't look like it, the rain is coming. You won't believe the story, but I was looking up at the clouds going, you know what, if you're going to rain, you must rain. And as I said that, the rain started. Mm -hmm. David couldn't quite believe it. I couldn't quite believe it. We just burst out laughing. I mean, how do you tell that story and get someone to believe what you are saying? But it also gives me a chance, this wattle, to have a look for something that I've been doing a little bit of research on lately, and that are and those are bagworms. Now quite often we show you the bagworms bag. A bagworm is a, uh, is a caterpillar for a bagworm moth, but it has a very different sort of life cycle to any other moth that you know. The immature moths, or the, 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 let's call the worms, both the male and the female will spin themselves a container made of silk and pieces of stick, whatever they, they have close to them. The males will get to a point where they then pupate and for a very short time, because they don't have developed mouth parts when they're adults, fly around looking for a female. The female bagworm stays a caterpillar their whole life. She doesn't turn into a moth and stays inside this bag her whole life, crawling around from place to place, um, dragging her home with her. Male then finds her, mates with her, she then lays a lot of eggs for an animal that big between my fingertips she lays up to a thousand five hundred eggs um, and they will all hatch into these little bags most of them get eaten of course i think the statistic i was reading is less than one percent of them actually survive into adulthood um, and then will become adult bagworms in the in the end males becoming the moth females becoming just this or staying in their in their in their homes and why i'm telling you massively long story without showing you anything is the fact that they live in these wattle trees this is one of the food plants of the bagworm and so I'm looking to see if we can find one now what is immediately apparent 
is the silken covering that we have on this plant in which is moving some organism. I don't quite know what that is just yet. That is not a bagworm. I can say that with conviction. Is it a spider? No? Now some form of insect is living inside that silk capsule. Now you get an animal called a silk spinner which um, are usually just in the tropics. You do find them here from, from time to time. A silk spinner is a animal that has pads on the front of its feet that's, that have highly concentrated silken glands and will spin themselves a silken tunnel and live in it, in this tunnel, feeding off tree sap. And I'm wondering if this is one. It doesn't look like it. The silk spinners that I know are bigger than this. A mystery. I don't know what's covering this tree in silk, but it's awesome nonetheless. Anyway, I think why don't we send you over to James for an update and we'll catch up with you in a little bit. Just a lovely picture here of two hornbills who I'm pretty sure have a nest somewhere. If not in this tree, it'll be somewhere around. Let me just be quiet and you can listen to them having a conversation with each other. They're just cleaning their beaks there on the side of the tree, talking. Wondering what's going to happen with their children. <laughs> That's a little bit territorial. The reason they're doing that is that there's a Birchall starling that came and sat on the same tree. Now, Birchall starling, of course, is also a hole nesting bird, so I suppose there might be some competition for nesting sites amongst them. I tell you, this time of the year, cavities in trees are at a premium. All the starlings, the hornbills, the rollers, the kingfishers, the sparrows, the barbets, the woodpeckers, all of them need holes in which to breed. Now we have 30 seconds, everybody, to go back to television. Let's hope that these uh, birds stay. No, they haven't. Great, we'll go back to TV with a picture of some wood. Mm, fantastic. I'm going to just sneak slightly forward because there's a flower. <coughs> Welcome back everybody to your live safari here in the blustery and kind of gunmetal grey skied Western Kruger Park. My name is James Henry. Jamie's out there. She's just been looking at some nyalas. Hopefully she's still with them. Steph has scouring the landscape for smaller things and he's just had a beetle, believe it or not. We have found a sign of summer over there. A hibiscus flower. Very nice. I'm not sure exactly which kind of hibiscus it is. I'm also not sure why it has bothered to come out on a day like this, which is uh, inescapably chilly, windy and rainy. But there it is, a little bit of yellow colour in amongst the green, greys and browns. All right, let's continue. We've had some hornbills up here. They have now unfortunately disappeared. I know, of course, now that I'm exactly the same people I was. Um, <laughs> Previously, so we'll just go back to that, shall we? Right, Steph is in the Mulwati somewhere around here. Let's go and find out what he's got for you. Have a look at this beautiful spray of flowers. This is the blue comelina, named after the Comlin brothers, who were two twins and had another younger brother. So they named it, this plant over them because of the fact that it's got three flower petals, two that are identical. That is much smaller. So the Comland 
the blue comelina. You do get a yellow comelina as well, but this is a blue one. Now it's used, I'm going to pick it there, very common flower, so don't worry about me doing any damage to this particular flower. But they're used, they're collected out here, and then that sap that you're going to see coming out there now, you can drink. See there, that mm -hmm. little dewdrop? Gives you a drop at a time. I mean, it's nothing much, but it's better than nothing. But have a look at how pretty these flowers are. One of my absolute favorites. Just jam-packed full of pollen at the moment. Awesome, eh? Beautiful. Mm, no noticeable smell. Oh, it's just everything smells good today. We've got a couple of flowers around here actually. Let me show you. So we've got one that I don't know, two that I do know. Let me show you this one. This is the Oldenlandia. This is an Oldenlandia. The unknown. And we are gonna. <laughs> Rebecca says it's very pretty. <laughs> and we can. Let's pick another one just to get the colors going. And a Waltheria that should make up the rest. There's my spray of flowers for today. <laughs> All right, we're going to need to get a rain cover onto this camera of ours, so we're going to be putting this. Let me see if I can tuck it behind one of my ginormous ears. There we go. My son would be horrified at the moment if he knew I was putting flowers in my hair. Can you imagine? All right, I'm going to put our rain cover on this camera in a bit. And we're going to go to Jamie, who's already got her rain cover on. See you in a bit. The rain is here and we're all very happy about it, if somewhat damp. And I'm sure that Steph's got to cover up all of the important and fragile equipment on the bushwalk backpack. In the meantime, we have been covering ourselves up properly. Brian has his skirt on. I think perhaps we need a slightly more... Um, a slightly less silly sounding name, but it really is a skirt. It is just a skirt. There's no other way of describing it. It is a skirt that wraps around the base of the camera to make sure that none of the water drips in the electronics that are down there. Obviously, I've got my monitor all covered up. And we shall continue our search for the animals in the rain. It's very patchy because now it's stopped again. But it feels as though it's coming and going and it's about to settle in for the afternoon. I think it might be an afternoon rehearsal. I'm going to go and see what's on quarantine. I can't find any sign of Karula. The lions crossed out of Juma. It feels as though our cats have decided that they don't want anything to do with us um, over the last few days. They've all vanished. It's most distressing. But that's okay, they'll be back tomorrow. Cat drought now, they'll be back tomorrow. I hope. It sounds as though the cheetah are on Torchwood going towards Buffelstock. They haven't found them, but they have found their tracks from yesterday. So the cheetah are going north. The cheetah brothers that we see on cheetah plains. Hold on a second. Sorry, hold on one moment. Ah, they have just found a mvula on Buffel's Hook. Uh. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> that was uh, that was a joke. They haven't found Mvula at all. Um, but Mvula, of course, means rain. So Taxon just called in rain on Buffel's hook. <laughs> I thought perhaps they found Mvula. Maybe there was a chance he was going to come south. No, they just meant they'd found the rain. I think it's more like the rain found them, to be honest. We know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> They're still laughing on the Game Drive radio. So the Game Drive channel is the way in which the different guides communicate with each other and they're all having a jolly good chuckle. Oh, quite disappointed. I thought maybe I'd be able to, if, if we hadn't seen any cats, perhaps I might just be able to give you an update on where our different cats are. But no, false alarm, my apologies. I missed the joke. I get it now. I wondered why Taxon was laughing and asking if Rexon wanted to stand by for the rain. It all makes so much more sense. So while I try to contain my overwhelming amusement, let's go over to Steph who's managed to get his rain covers on. Now, a couple of days ago, I found a species, a, a, a similar species of spider holding a wasp by its head. And I've just been struck dumb by what this spider web is. I don't actually know. Why is the spider doing this? This is what I thought at the time to be a crab spider, but has managed to spin this very bizarre, very symmetrical, funny web. Anchor lines? all over the place to this whitish, let me just move this other way so that you can see a better view there, there we go, to this whitish, it looks like an egg sac of some sorts. I almost think it's a type of lure. I think that this is this spider's web and it waits on this white silken capsule and grabs whatever comes close to it because it's, 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 it's have a look here at the anchor points. You've got web here, here, there, and there, this long one, and then down to the stick I'm holding. And it's anchored very firmly, that, that capsule, in three dimensions at almost 90 degrees to one another. It really is quite amazing. I don't know what this is. I'm almost certain that it's a lure of some sort. This is the spider's web. It may have some eggs in that capsule. It's also got that funny head with the two eyes on the back. Oh, you might even find that... I don't know. This has stumped me. I'm going to be with my head in my spider book when I get back home just now. And see if I can actually find this and come and show it to you again at some point. Because I don't know. I don't know what spider that is and I don't know what type of web construction this is. The single weirdest web construction I've seen in the last couple of months, at least anyway. <laughs> and the, the thought of me going through my spider book is terrifying. It's, it has the most useless key in and is deeply frustrating because I can't figure it out. <laughs> what I can show you though is have a look at the way that the silk has been attached there as an anchor point. Now spiders are quite common for taking this particular silk and splitting it over an anchor point, thus distributing the, the tension and making for a much stronger anchor. Does, can you focus on that, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Have, just have a look at how spectacular that anchor point is. Much, much stronger than if it was just attached to a single point. Very cool. Now the rain is coming down in earnest, and it's a good thing. We've been looking forward to this rain all the time. It's not, we're not hearing any thunder or lightning. It's just this soft rain that's sort of falling intermittently. That's, and the, the period between these squalls are getting shorter and shorter, which is a good thing, because that's exactly what we need. We need a bit of a soaking today. We need it to come down between safaris and really pummel down so that we can get nice, deep soak but I suppose it can wait off a little bit until we get home. It's freezing at the moment. <laughs> I'm the person that gets cold easy. Oh. Anyway, 
Let's have a look for one more thing. Is it baboon spider's hole catching some silk? or catching some water in its silk, but um, it has no garbage pile, unfortunately, this one. So I think from myself, while I get wet over here, I'm just gonna say, thank you very much for your support today. We'll catch you again in the next Bushwalk Safari. You're off to James or Jamie, I think. Oh, the parlor is dashing. Oh, shelter, there it is, that's the rain. That's it. Oh, cover the monitor. There we go. Oh, come on, Rain. It is lovely. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not that I'm not grateful. But it could have waited three minutes before it started bucketing down. I was, <laughs> we were so close to getting home and dry. Relatively dry. Relatively unscathed. Now it's pouring with rain. I don't know where James is. But I imagine that he is racing home as we speak. Ah, oh, well, at least our... Oh, no. Here it comes from the rain cover itself down the middle of my back. <laughs> the rain cover very kindly redirects all water away from anything damageable and down my lower back. Emily, you've just looked up the bathroom bazaar ad and it's going to be stuck in your head for a while. Emily, if you're anything like any of us South Africans, it's going to be stuck in your head for the next 10 years or so. But I'm glad to see that you had a look at it. it is, isn't it the worst jingle you've ever heard? It is the most irritating advert in the world. All right, little impalalas, you're going to be sheltering here. I think we should go and seek out shelter as well, Brian. Shame. They can't go underneath the roof, but we can. And we shall. I'm just going to drain away some of the water so that it doesn't redirect down the back of my back. All right, let us start racing for home, Brian. The rain is pouring. Oh, it looks like it's stopping a little bit, just, in, just after getting us soused. And on that note, it is time for us to say goodbye um, on behalf, and a thank you on behalf of James and Viam as well. So thank you, Brian, for your wonderful camera work and, of course, for that wonderful smile of yours, which I think we all enjoyed. <laughs> as well as to all of you, thank you to Rebecca and to Jerry in Final Control, and all of you for joining us this morning. And Lou, Rebecca, Jerry, and Lou, all in Final Control. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you and Alex and Zander. Thank you, Rebecca. The entire Safari Live team, thank you. Thank you very much. It is raining. I'm going to go and get dry. I will see you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody.